Now here we go. I'm going to finish off this discussion of the, eschatolo- the resolution of the eschatological crisis. Um, we got kind of, as I was talking about that, the question came, is this, is this really the case? You know, uh, isn't Islam a religion of peace? How does that work? Um, the Quran repeatedly calls for judgment to fall on the heads of disbelievers by the hands of believers. Um, so the Quran says, fight them until there's no more persecution. That word persecution in Islam is interpreted very broadly. Anything that undermines Muslims in their faith could be persecution. Fitna, as it's called. Fight them until there's no more fitna and the religion, all of it, belongs to Allah. Or surely those who hurt Allah and his messenger, Allah has cursed them in this world and the hereafter. So there's a judgment on, in this world and in the next, which validates the, um, the violence. Um, it's very interesting. There's a verse in the Quran that says that this violence has a soothing effect on the hearts of Muslims. Fight them. Allah will punish them by your hands and disgrace them and help you against them and heal the hearts of people who, disp- who believe and take away all the rage from your hearts. It's Surah 9. So what that's saying is that Muslims feel anger and hatred against non-Muslims, but if you fight them and kill them, your heart will be soothed and you'll find peace. So there's that anxiety, the eschatological crisis, the anxiety about the criticism, the mockery, the opposition, that'll be resolved when you kill them. You'll feel good again. It's actually quite shocking when you read these things. Um, No one ever told me this verse was there, but I read it and I thought, that's really quite incredible. This is not the gospel. This is not what Jesus said is the pathway to peace. I have a teaching which I'm not going to give now, but more based on the life of Muhammad, because today I'm speaking about the Quran. Muhammad had a lot of rejection in his life, a lot of experiences of rejection, but his, his way of responding to rejection was always not good, you know, validating himself, attacking others, um, and the very opposite of everything that Jesus did when he experienced rejection. It's an interesting, interesting study which I talk about in Liberty to the Captives. Um, rejection is a big issue in Islam, how to respond to rejection, how to respond to it well. Some biblical themes are really interesting. How does the, how does the Quran treat the Bible in the light of these two phases? In the earlier phase, it uses the Bible as paradigmatic examples of messengers to support the messengers' self-description. So the story of Noah was an example, or Adam and Eve, you know, it's right to be rightly guided. After this eschatological crisis and the transition, it looks to biblical figures to validate the violence and the hatred. How does it do that? And this is where the gap between the Bible and the Quran becomes quite apparent. Um, Ibrahim, Abraham, is cited as a model of hatred. There's a verse that says he's the perfect model of hatred or enmity. And it's speaking about Abraham's attitudes to his enemies. It was really striking with, for me because I was studying all this and analysing. And then one day, someone sent me a clip of one of the Islamic State leaders burning his passport, cutting his passport up. And then he starts quoting this passage, Allah has set enmity and hatred between us and you forever, and Abraham's the perfect model. And I was thinking, there he goes. He's been reading, he's been reading the text, and that's where he gets it from. Um, in, in Surah 5, verse 78, it says that both David and Jesus cursed the Jews. There you go. So uh, the Jews are one of the groups the Quran is not happy with. Surah 2, um, it says that the people of Israel are fighting in the way of Allah. Now, fighting in the way of Allah is, the, is an Islamic term used for the jihad under, under the messenger. And it, so this is referring to Saul's battles, actually. It takes a story about Saul and fighting battles, and this is fighting in the way of Allah. And in Surah 3, it says, Many a prophet has fought. How many a prophet has fought, and with him fought many, I don't know, religious leaders, but they didn't weaken when they uh, struck them in the way of Allah. All that they said was, Our Lord, give us the victory over people who are disbelievers. So Allah gave them the reward of this world and the good reward of the hereafter. So what he's saying here is that the prophets, and that's a biblical term in the Quran, the prophets in the Bible, they have killed others in the name of Allah too. And so this is an example of messenger uniformitarianism being applied to validate the messenger's current experience. I think when he's talking about some of these things, um, the actual basis of this from a biblical background is very, very thin. 
It's more reading into that past and claiming it. Another interesting uh, concept in the Quran is the idea of successors. One group succeeding another. There's an observation in the aftermath of Acts of God that when Allah destroys a community, other successors, caliphat, will take the place of those who are destroyed. This is mentioned a number of times. Allah often destroyed one people and replaced them with another. How many a town which were doing evil we have smashed and produced another people after it. And the Quran at many points says that the believers are the ones who will inherit the property of disbelievers, just as happened in the past. So, Surah 14, their Lord inspired them, we shall indeed destroy the evildoers and cause you to inhabit the land after them. Or Surah 33, this is speaking about the a battle against the Jews in Khaybar, about which radical Muslims still chant in the Middle East. Uh, remember Khaybar. The armies of Muhammad are coming to destroy you. So this, this verse says, He brought down from their fortifications those of the people of the book who supported them and cast dread into their hearts, cast fear into their hearts. You killed some of them and took others captive. This is speaking um, to the Prophet, Allah speaking to the Prophet. And he caused you, the Muslim community, to inherit their land, their homes and their wealth and a land you had not set foot on. Allah is powerful over everything. So what it's saying is that you destroyed the Jews by the will of Allah and you took over all their property and their homes and their villages as well. And the land is now yours. Um, so this is not just replacement theology in terms of claiming someone's spiritual heritage. It involves physical replacement as well. The concept of successors. It's a genocidal idea, actually. I'd like to talk with you about categories of disbelievers. Um, but it doesn't matter about the screen. Um, it'd be good just to just just to um, grasp the different kinds of disbelievers in the Quran. I'll step you through what the Quran says about disbelievers, because it can be a bit confusing. There are two words that describe disbelief or disbelievers. One is kafir, and the other is mushri. Um, No, Mushrik, sorry. Okay. Um, this is based on the sh er -kaf, um, root, which is to associate, and this is based on a different root. Okay. What are the differences between these two? Um, this is often translated polytheists or idolaters. It actually means associators. This word, this root that's formed in kafir means to hide or cover. It implies ingratitude, rejecting the signs of God, the benevolence of God. It applies to all kinds of disbelievers. Any kind of disbelief is the noun for it is kufr. It means disbelief. And the equivalent here is shirk. Shirk means associating anything with God. So pagan Arabs are the really the, 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 are, 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 the actually the term for pagan Arabs in the Quran is mushrik. They, that's what they're called. But it's a broader category. Jews and Christians are also called associators, but often the term is just used for the pagan Arabs, the ones who haven't yet embraced Islam. Um, these two, kufr is, is, is covering over or deceiving or rejecting science. So it's rejection of God and shirk is a word describing the way the rejection occurs. You reject God by associating others with him. You're, you're associating others with God. You, you're, you're not treating him as having sole rights of patronage and, and ownership over the world. Um, so these are the two kind of dimensions of disbelief in the Quran. Uh, it's a very offensive word in Islam to call someone a, a kufr, kufir, uh, or a... Um, or mushrik, but, but these are the terms that are used to refer to disbelievers. Um, there are many negative stereotypes of disbelievers in the Quran. Uh, they reject signs, they tell lies, they're arrogant, they're transgressors, they're ungrateful, they're greedy for life. That means they're not ready to live for the next life. They're ignorant, they're untrustworthy, they spread hostility, they're corrupt. Um, but there are a number of specific categories of, of disbelievers. Uh, one is the hypocrites. The hypocrites are the ones who were Muslims or were they professed to be Muslims, but they either 
tried to leave Islam or they didn't come to the party. So they didn't go to, to war, for example. They were not willing to fight. They were not willing to do what was required of them. So they're the hypocrites. Not good to be a hypocrite. I think the Quran says the lowest place in hell is reserved for them. Um, disbelieving Arabs, the pagan Arabs, they're generally called mushrik associators. They venerate female angels, they have these other deities, they worship Allah alongside other deities. Then there's the people of the book, which is a joint category. Um, these are a people who, whose, whose ancestors, through a messenger, received a book from Allah. So these are particularly the Jews and Christians are the main categories under the people of the book. The greatest hostility are to the hypocrites um, and the Jews, but also the disbelieving Arabs. Actually, Christians come off a little bit less bad than some of these other groups. In fact, the Quran says that the people closest in love to Muslims are Christians. Um, sure, why do they hate the Jews so much? I think there's a few different reasons. Um, one is uh, there was a lot of anti-Jewish um, stereotypes in Christianity at the time, and I think it's pretty clear that the messenger took over a lot of those stereotypes into Islam. Secondly, uh, there weren't there's very little evidence of interaction between Muslim community and Christians, for example, in the Hadith or Islam's origin stories. Um, and even in the Quran, there's not a lot of evidence that the, this, this initial Muslim community was engaging a lot with Christians. They must have, but there's not a point of friction or tension. But what we do see is there's a lot of tension with local Jews. And in the Quran, this ends up being a series of stories about how Muhammad gradually pushed out the Jews from Medina and then he committed genocide against the last remaining group. So there's an actual kind of physical con conflict going on with the Jewish community who are not accepting his claim to be the, the final prophet. He, um, the life of Muhammad, as told by Muslims, says that he interacted with the Jews of Medina and they didn't accept his claim that he was the prophet foretold by God or the, the, the messenger you know, that had been foretold. And they, they decided not to follow him and they rejected him and that caused him to be very angry at them. And he said, um, the land belongs to Allah and to the messenger. Um, you should become a Muslim and you'll be safe. Um, Aslim Taslam, convert and you'll be safe. Actually, Islam means, I could talk about the meaning of Islam, I'll do that in a minute. But So he said to them, if you become Muslims, you'll be safe. But they didn't, so they were not safe. And he killed them. Um, so uh, so there's, that, there's a kind of existential struggle with the Jews. It's part of the birth story of Islam. Not that they were, I don't, the, the, the Muslim history says they were hostile, but actually in Islam's own stories there's very evidence, that there's very little evidence of their hostility. They were sort of demonised uh, to justify the jihad against them. And the further away you get in sources from the earliest, the, earliest, the earlier the sources are, the less negative they are about the Jews. But as the story gets told more and more by later Muslim authorities, they get more and more evil, you know, in the, in the telling. And you might ask a deeper question, why do people hate the Jews? And I don't know, people hate what God loves, I think. It's a deep theological question that I don't have all the answers for. But there's no doubt that there's a lot of anti-Semitic stereotypes in the Quran that are hardwired into the text, and it's quite shocking, actually. Um, in a, as for the associate, the, the, the pagans, in, the, in a dramatic passage at the beginning of the ninth chapter, believers are called to cancel all tr treaties made with their pagan Arab neighbours, the associators, to expel them, uh, that they're unclean, and to wage war upon them, killing them, enslaving them. And the emphasis particularly on their offensive religious practices. The hypocrites, as I said, are those who had, a, had sworn belief in Allah and in the Messenger, but later turned away. These are the ones who, as the Quran said, disbelieved after believing. Um, for example, this is from Surah 63. The hypocrites come to you and they say, we bear witness that you are indeed the messenger of Allah. Allah knows that you are his messenger and Allah bears witness. And he bears witness to say, surely the hypocrites are liars. They've taken their oaths as a cover and they've kept people from the way of Allah. Surely um, they're evil. That's because they believed and then they disbelieved. And in Islam, 
people who are regarded as bad Muslims, that's the category they get slotted into. So um, people who should be good Muslims and aren't, they can be called hypocrites. So that's what the Shia say about the Sunnis and the Sunnis say about the Shia. So, and um, there's a lot, of, a lot of hatred in the Quran towards this, this category of not being a good Muslim. Um, actually, this whole system is quite unstable because as soon as one Muslim group starts criticizing another, they risk a kind of warfare with them. And in order to prevent that, traditional Islamic theology has emphasized the duty of Muslims to be obedient to the state and to submit to the ruler, whoever he is. Even if, if, he, if he prays and allows Islam to be practiced, you have to submit it to him even if he's a bad Muslim. And that's been one of the debates in the Middle East. So there were leading Sunni um, experts and theologians, scholars uh, in Damascus who said you should obey President Assad because he's the president of Syria. And then you had others like al Khadawi in Qatar saying, no, he, he's a, you know, this is infidelity and he should be killed. I mean, he, he should fight against him. And so there's a difference. And actually the ones that opted for the jihad, they're the ones that have caused the country to fall apart, in fact. And you could say that the, um, those that supported Assad have been proved right in that um, if, if this war hadn't started, many, many lives would not have been lost. But Islam, Islam's uh, theology, a political theology, tries to suppress the inherently destabilizing and conflictual tendencies within the Quran of declaring enmity against unbelievers. The difference between the two and the Shias, I know that this view is the succession, but is there one to this? Is it a different theology? Yes, there was a dispute basically between the relatives of Muhammad, between his his cousin or nephew Ali and his um, the family of his wife, young wife Aisha. And the, the Shia followed Ali, and they believed that the successors to Muhammad should be from the family of Muhammad, but the Sunnis didn't agree with that, and they fought very soon afterwards. And the Shia uh, venerate the sons of Ali as martyrs. Um, there are some important uh, differences in, in Islamic law, and there's also a difference in feel as well, or ethos. Um, just one difference in Islamic law, Muhammad gave permission for Muslim fighters to marry someone temporarily. So you could, for example, give someone some money or a, or a shirt and then be married to them for a few hours on the battlefield. And this, this um, institution of temporary marriage was suspended by a later caliph, a Sunni-oriented one, and the Shia still, they don't accept that. They believe they're pure and following Muhammad. So in, in Iran today, there are clerics who make a living out of marrying people for a few hours. Uh, in, and there are women who make a living out of marrying people every day. Um, so that's one difference. And um, that's a big difference in the sense that Sunnis think it's prostitution and Shia think they're following Muhammad. Um, that, that a more important difference is that the Shia kept... Um, they have a very high regard for leaders and they believe that the rightly guided caliphs continued on for quite a long time and they allowed a kind of progressive revelation as well. And, and in the structure of the way Shia societies work is they look to a leader in a very, even more than Sunnis do. So Iranians, they always have someone that they're following and maybe they're people that follow them. Everyone is about following people, you know? And so someone might have a hundred, it's like Facebook really, only it's, you've got a lot of followers. So you might have a hundred thousand followers or 10,000 followers and the Shia are really oriented towards these kind of divinely inspired leaders. I, because the Iranian congregation I lead in Melbourne is all made of ex-Shia, I have to work really hard against that and tell them that they're following Jesus, not me. You know, because they want someone that they want to hang on to. Um, and so you get this ayatollah, you know, this, uh, this religious leader who has great power um, and authority. Uh, so the, the way the political structures work because is different because of that that influence as well. Um, um, so here's a, here's a comment on the hypocrites. If the hypocrites do stop, uh, if they don't stop their you know, rejection of the messenger, we'll incite you against them and then they will um, only be your neighbours for a little while. They are a curse. Wherever they are found, they should be killed, seized and completely killed. Um, and then those who've broken with Allah and the Messenger, this is the one about striking the necks and the fingers. 
Um, the people of the book, however, there's quite a lot of ambivalence in the Quran. There's positive things said about them and negative. It sort of oscillates. Um, sometimes it says they're mostly bad, but some are good. And sometimes it says they're good, but, they're, but some of them are bad. Um, but the final word is a series of, of verses that speak about fighting them, particularly 929, fight those of the people of the book until they pay tribute and the surrender and are disgraced. Um, Islamic law um, distinguishes these, characters, these groups. So the hypocrites technically should be fought against. They, they have to become good Muslims or, or else. The, the, the pagan Arabs, they also have death or Islam, but the, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, they can have a choice. They've got three choices. That's my book, the third choice. Um, they, can, they can become Muslims, they can um, fight, or they can surrender and live under Islamic rule. So that's a concession made to the people of the book. So there's some variation um, there. So in summary, the Quran's attitude to non-believers is firstly, call them to faith. Secondly, dissociate from them. Don't partner with them or take them as allies. So don't make friends, it says a number of times. Don't allow yourself to come under their authority. Curse them, show them no compassion, fight them to either kill them, convert them or make them subject. Um, the Quran says, surely Allah has purchased from the believers their lives and their wealth with the price of the garden. They fight in the way of Allah and they kill and they are killed. So there you go, enough of that depressing subject. Many Muslims live a kind of simple Islamic faith. They say their prayers, they might try and get to Mecca, they pay their zakat. Uh, they're, they're, they're just not interested in these, all these other things. You know, they're, they're actually just trying to do what many simple Christians do. Um, the problem comes when someone tries to implement an Islamic system, which is all this stuff. And then you get, you know, the revivalist movements have tried to do that. I'll come back to that in a bit. I want to speak about this issue of the relationship between Islam, Christianity and Judaism. I have on your handout a piece of paper, a little diagram, showing the relationship of Judaism and Christianity. In linguistics, we have this idea of a family tree. You can show how languages are related to each other, where they come from. You know, French comes from Latin and and it's related to Spanish, which also comes to Latin, and it's a kind of tree. Well, this is the family tree of Judaism and Christianity, according to Mark Dury, anyway. You have this period of intertestamental Judaism around the time of Jesus, which is quite diverse, and there are several different Jewish sects and streams. So there are the Sadducees, which is the temple sect. There are the Essenes, who are off in the desert you know, living ascetic life and having their own interesting theology, which has come out through the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are the Pharisees. And the Pharisees end up winning the day. So the Pharisees become the rabbinical Judaism of, of today. The other groups disappear. The Sadducees go when the temple is destroyed. The Essenes, their way of life was somehow lost, destroyed as well. Um, the Pharisees are... You know, the, the, the structure of the Talmud, of Judaism as it exists today, it comes straight out of Pharise the Pharisees of Jesus' time. And they were able to reorganize their spirituality and their practice when the temple was destroyed. For today, rabbinical Judaism is based not only on the Hebrew scriptures, but also a whole body of oral traditions uh, including, say, the Talmud. Jesus referred to this when he was criticizing the Pharisees about their, their oral traditions that they were following. And um, so Judaism today is not just a religion of the Old Testament. It's a religion of the Old Testament plus all these materials that are really very, very important. And sometimes it's called a hedge around the, the Bible. So it, it's, it's through that hedge of all the, the traditions that you interpret the scriptures. The other Jewish movement of intertestinal Judaism is what we call Christianity. It was started as a Jewish sect. And it seems quite clear in the teachings of Jesus that it wasn't conceived of as a separate religion different from Judaism. Um, and there's been quite a movement of scholars writing about the separation between Christianity and Judaism, and they argue that it took place over quite a long period of time. 
And it was certainly quite, you know, maybe not until the second century that people began to really see that there were different religions emerging. Uh, for a long time, Christianity would have been thought of as a form of Judaism. And it, 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 it derives out of a Jewish context. Its Bible was the Septuagint, the, the Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament. And Christian theological categories derive from Jewish categories. You know, the Trinity is deeply influenced by Jewish theological categories. The idea of the presence of God, for example, is really critical. Um, Judaism at the time of Jesus was much more uh, varied than it is today because only one sect, I mean, it is varied today, but there, was, uh, there were various ideas floating around that, you know, died out later. So then Juda Christ Christianity made a break with Judaism basically by rejecting the Torah, a conformity to the Torah, and it became a Gentile project, not Jewish, although today there are Messianic Jewish synagogues and seeking to claim a new kind of Jewish Christianity. There was, at the time of the first few centuries, a continuing stream of Jewish Christianity, of Messianic Jewish groups that, that gradually died out, took several centuries before they disappeared. And some scholars have suggested that um, these groups might have influenced the Quranic community because of the, the difficulty of interpreting the material in the Quran. Well, what's the relationship between this family of religions, Judaism and Christianity, who are sort of like cousins who come from the same source and share a, a common formation? You know, the, the communion service is actually based originally upon a Jewish ritual. Uh, and baptism is a Jewish rite, and the idea of salvation or the Messiah, these, are all, these all come out of Jewish practice and religion. Um, how, do you, how do you fit in the Islam? Where does it fit on the tree? You know, where, where does it come from? And there is an assumption that's common in our society that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are a family of religions, a monotheistic religions, Abrahamic religions, I believe they're called. If you look up Wikipedia, it's all over Wikipedia. You know, these are Abrahamic faiths. What does that mean? You know, it doesn't have any meaning at all. Actually, the phrase, the religion of Abraham, is a Quranic phrase, and it means Islam. So to use that phrase to refer to Abrahamic to, to a group of religions is problematic. Sorry, also, just repeat that. So the, phrase the religion of Abraham is, is the Quran and it refers to Islam in contrast to Judaism and Christianity. You know, in, in Islam, in, in Judaism, Abraham is the example of a perfect Torah observant Jew. In Christianity, he's the man who lived by faith. In Islam, he's the perfect Muslim. He's a very divisive figure, anyway. People call him our father, but... Um, but put that aside, all this talk about Abrahamic faiths and, you know, let's put it aside for the time being. How do we understand the relationship of Islam to this? There's a lot of biblical stuff in the Quran, but there's a lot of disconnection with the Bible as well. What's the relationship like? I want to give you a few metaphors, okay? One is a building metaphor. You can have a building, like a house, and you can extend the house, maybe put a few minarets on it or something. I don't know what you do. It's still the same house, but it's been changed a bit. And I think that's sort of what happened with Christianity and intertestamental Judaism. Uh, a religious tradition was augmented, some things were changed, Satan became more important. You had the Messiah has come instead of yet to come, but it developed. You know, I'm speaking about religion as a social human activity. Um, but there's another way to have a, con a relationship, and that is you demolish the house altogether and you reuse the bricks and build something completely different. And I think that's what Islam is like. It uses lots of bricks taken out of a synagogue or out of a church, and they're all over the place. And when you walk into, them, into this building, you say, oh, that comes from there, and I recognize that, and I recognize that, but everything's in the wrong place, and it's being used for a different purpose. That thing that was a pillar is now part of the foundations and, you know, that was the threshold. It's now up on the wall. It's, it's, everything's different. The story of Adam and Eve, it's no longer, an, you know, a parable on the sinfulness of humanity. And the story of Noah is no longer about the covenantal faithfulness of God. It's about the nature of a messenger, a Quranic messenger. So 
Under this understanding, there's a profound discontinuity between Islam and, and the biblical faiths. So Judaism and Christianity actually share a formative tradition, but Islam doesn't in that sense. It uses a lot of material, but without comprehending it, it repurposes. It repurposes. And I'll give you a few examples of that repurposing. Um, in the Quran, there is this idea of the Messiah, al Masih. And it's a title of Jesus, Isa al-Masih. Okay. It's clearly borrowed, probably from Syriac, Masih. And which comes then from, it's a form based on the Hebrew, Mashiach, which means the anointed one. And it has a lot of theology attached to it. Narrative, ritual, history, the history of the kingdom, the messianic psalms, the themes and the prophets. This word Messiah has so much attached to it, so much theology attached to it. It's full of meaning. And um, I still see it on the bumper bars in, uh, in Caulfield, where I live in Melbourne, which is the most intensely settled Jewish area in the Southern Hemisphere, I think. Uh, the Messiah is on his way. You know? And I actually know what they mean. I, I think I know what they mean by the Messiah because it's part of my tradition. Um, the, the, word, the verb means to smear or to anoint. And Mashiach is a passive participle. It means an, a smeared one or an anointed one. And in Syriac, also, it's a passive participle. It's derived from the word to anoint. It's borrowed into Syriac Christianity um, in a productive way. But what's interesting is when this word shows up in Arabic, it produces a form which is not actually a result of Arabic grammatical rules. You can't derive this from, easily from a verb. So they've borrowed a form from another language, which is not a recognizably Arabic form. That makes sense. Like in, in Greek, Christos means anointed one in Greek. It actually has that meaning. But Masih in Arabic, it's not clear what it means, but it sounds similar to Masih in, in, in Syriac, which did mean something. And it's a really interesting question to, to ask, what does Islamic tradition think Masih means? What does this title mean? And the commentators are really interesting. One dictionary maker, al Firuzabadi, he said there were 50 different meanings have been proposed for al Masih. One early commentary suggested that this could mean that Jesus traveled a lot from one country to another, or it could mean the king, or it could mean he has standing opposition amongst the people in the life of the world. The idea that he travels a lot is an attempt to relate it to a route, which means to travel or wander around. So it's trying to link, it's trying to see the route, uh, it's trying to give a grammatical analysis to it. Ibn Kathir, who's a very famous commentator, he tried to relate it to the root, um, to this root. Sorry, got the wrong dot there. To this root, which is related to Hebrew, it means to touch. So it's like anointing is touching. So in Arabic, it means to touch. And he says he's called um, the one who touches, or the, this word masi, because when he touched people, they'd be healed. So he was touching people. He was the toucher. He's the toucher. And um, Ibn Baz, who was the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, a uh, decade or two back, he said, why? He considered the question, why is Jesus, Isa, the son of Maryam, called Al Masih? He suggested lots of interpretations. Some have suggested that he had flat feet because his feet were touching the ground. Um, but he said that it's actually irrelevant what it means. Here's what he says. Esau, the son of Mariam, is called al Masif because he did not touch any sick or disabled person except that they were cured. So when he touched people, they were healed. Some of the Salaf, the first gener few generations, also said that he was called al Masif because of his contact with the earth. He was touching the earth with his feet and his frequent traveling. So he tried to combine those two explanations. According to these two sayings, um, uh, uh, al Masik means one who touches. It also said that he's al Masik because his feet were flat, with no hollow to the soles of his feet, and it was said that he touched the, the, with blessings, or that he was purified from sins and was therefore blessed. And this would mean, Masik would mean mamsuk, one who is touched, 
But the first meaning, that is the one who touches, is more obvious, and Allah knows best. In any case, there is no connection between this and belief or action, and the benefit of knowing it is minimal. So you hear what he's saying? Actually, it doesn't matter what it means. It's irrelevant. It wasn't, doesn't need to know what al Masih means. This is a fruitless discussion. Let's forget about it. So that's a good example of a, of a term that's rich in theological meaning, gets borrowed into the Quran, can't be analysed anymore, and it's used as the title for Jesus, but without any content. And in fact, it's better not to think too much about it, because it doesn't make any difference to how you live. And remember, Islam is about orthopractice. It's what you do, not what you believe. And so this doesn't have any relevance. It's a really interesting and telling argument. And, you know, I've had some interesting conversations with Muslims. So I said, what does al Masih mean? You know, you call him Jesus. You say he's al Masih. You say that you're venerating him by calling him the Messiah. What are you doing? What does that mean, actually, at all? So that's an example of a brick being reused. But the brick, which had a meaning, it had a context, has been stripped of that. It's been used just as window dressing. It's just a, like name dropping, really. If you were translating this into Arabic today, you wouldn't call Jesus al Masih. You'd use a term that actually meant the anointed one in the language, even if it didn't sound similar. Um, what happened was that Arabic would take words and it would choose something in Arabic that sounded similar, but often the meaning would change or it would disappear because there wasn't that background in, uh, of the understanding of the text. Um, another example is Ruh al Qudus. The Holy Spirit. In the Quran. As I said before, this root um, is in Arabic and it means to move away, but it's not used for sacredness. That the word used for sacredness is the word in haram, which means forbidden. And so that this, this, this word Qudus, which sounds similar to the, the Syriac form, um, doesn't actually can't be analysed grammatically. It can't be interpreted in Arabic. It's just a word that sounds similar to what we've borrowed. And it doesn't have the association in Arabic with holiness. Also, this word Ruh, um, which is similar to Hebrew Ruah, also has some problems. So in Ruah, you have a word that can mean spirit or breath, um, a wind. So it has these polysemies. And also pneuma in Greek means has the same polysemy. It can mean spirit, breath, or wind. But in Arabic, ruh means to a puff of air. Like if you're blowing something up, like blowing up a sheepskin, or you're blowing on a fire to blow it out. So this actually means the holy puff, but, but kudos actually is unanalyzable. So it's, it's a weird foreign holy puff. You don't know what holy puff it is. And, and it gets interpreted in the Quran as meaning an angel, the angel Gabriel. So in the story of the Annunciation to Mary, it says the angel Gabriel blew into her, into her vulva in one version, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit, which is the angel Gabriel blowing into her. So you get these bits and pieces in the story that actually get completely reinterpreted. There is an angel Gabriel and he, she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Oh, the Holy Spirit must be the angel Gabriel. He blew into her vulva. And um, so you, you get something that sounds, it, it's actually, it sounds like the Syriac, which is raw. Let me get this right. Syriac frontier. So this is the Syriac, and it's actually this all makes sense. It's it's what it means in Hebrew. It's, you know, it, it, it's a good translation. And this turns up into Arabic as Ruh al Qudus. So the Ad is just becomes the Al, the definite article. There's no definite article in the Syriac. It's Holy Spirit. Here it gets added in. Sounds similar, sort of fits. Oh, we've heard this phrase in Syriac. This is what it is in Arabic, but it doesn't mean it anymore. So I mean, I have seen people, modern scholars, writing about the Quran and saying that the Quran refers to the Holy Spirit with capital um, H, capital S, but it doesn't. It's using a phrase that's been matched because of its, its, its sound, but it actually means something completely different. 
Um, let me give you one more example. Uh, you can see my interest in linguistics coming through here. I've lost my... There's a really interesting a word in Hebrew, which means the dwelling of God with people. The Shekinah. Shekinah glory, sometimes people call it. And the, the root means to dwell. So God comes and dwells with his people. And it's the glory of God dwelling with people. And in Arabic, there's this, um, there's this word, Sakina. Um, and the, it, it's clearly used in stories where there's reference to the Shekinah in the Hebrew. But the meaning of this root, S-K-N, in Arabic, it means it doesn't actually so much dwell as to be at rest or still, or therefore calm. And this form is actually analyzable in Arabic, and it means something like reassurance, or calming, um, calming encouragement. And the way this is used in Arabic, although it shows up in stories where you'd have this in the Hebrew, it actually means God encouraged or, or, or reassured his people. So there's an example of someone has heard this word being used, maybe in Syriac in, or in, in Hebrew, and they've, they've kind of put it into their text, into their Islamic text, and they've reanalyzed it as an Arabic word with an Arabic meaning, and it's lost its connection. So what's happening here is that you have a, a religious community that's emerging with its own theology, and I've described some of that theology that's quite different from the Quran. There's no idea of messengers like, like that in the Bible. It's a, it's a distinctive set of ideas, something similar, but it's a lot of differences. And it's picking, it's taking stuff out of Judaism and Christianity without comprehending that material, but fitting it into the new theology. And I use an analogy from the history of languages to describe this. Um, and that is from uh, Creole linguistics. Um, a Creole, uh, let me explain how a Creole arises. If you have, say, what happened in, in, in the Pacific, where people would get um, slave labor, actually, from different societies, different language groups, and put them together on a plantation, they developed a new language in which the lexicon comes from English, but the grammatical categories, the worldview, and the meaning is that of the languages of these people. And so in Solomon Islands Pidgin in the um, Creole, in the Pacific, the grammar of the Solomon Islands Pidgin, its structure and its worldview is just like Solomon Islands languages, but its vocabulary has been taken from English. Another example is Haitian Creole. All the voc most of the vocabulary of Haitian Creole is French, but its grammar is West African, completely West African. Another example is Voodoo. This is a religion, not a language, but um, the religion Voodoo in Haiti is actually West African religion. Its structure is very West African, the different gods. But the, the gods are renamed as saints, and they use Christian names for these gods. So it's it's, it's um, all the, the meaning comes from what's called the substrate language, the, the language of the people who are brought in as slave workers. But the form of the words comes from the superstrate language. So you get a, you, the meaning is produced from within, but the, the structures, the forms come from without. So this is a bit like this with the Quran. The Quran borrows all this material but it doesn't incorporate the meanings of the material. It supplies its own meanings. It gives its own meanings to it. So you get a religion that can borrow a huge amount of material, like a Creole can have thousands of words taken from French or from English, but the heart of the language, the, the structure of the language, the meaning of the language is purely African, you know, or, or Solomon Islanders or whatever. And Islam is like that. And really key aspects of the theology of, of, the, of Islam come out of an Arab environment. So I, I gave an example with the theology of God. It's based on these concepts of patronage and power in a tribal context. They're not, it doesn't come from the Bible. 
um, but it's dressed up in this material that looks biblical but actually isn't. And that's why I think it's quite confusing to speak about Abrahamic faiths. I, um, I don't have a derogatory view of Creoles. They're fantastic and interesting languages. They're not inferior languages. They have a creative history, you know. Um, and they're very rich and expressive. And Islam is an amazing creative, you know, adventure. Someone's created this thing and then intellectually I'm amazed at what they did and how they put it together and sometimes appalled and horrified when I look at the ethical implications. Um, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't build on a biblical foundation. It doesn't incorporate biblical theology. It doesn't have an affinity with biblical theology, and it doesn't create societies that look like Jewish or Christian societies, because it's built on very different understanding of human beings, different understanding of God. But what's confusing for us is because it's dressed up in all this biblical language, it feels like it is part of the one family. And actually part of Islam's own apologetic is to say, we worship the same God, we, we acknowledge Jesus. We, we have the same faith. There's pressure in Europe not to talk about Judeo-Christian civilization, but to speak about Abrahamic civilization. And that pressure is coming from Muslim communities because they want to reorient the history of, of Europe so it's an Islamic history. And they want to reclaim and reposition Europe as an Islamic kind of, kind of creation.